Good evening, good evening, everybody. It's a, such a joy to be here this evening again together with you all, just sharing life and trusting that you be equipped and that you be given tools into your hand and heart to help you in being an effective witness for him. But before we, we chat this evening, my wife, I just want to give her apologies as it's Mother's Day today. My two daughters are spoiling and treating her. You know, they have those pamper evenings and pajama evenings and whatever, whatever. When I left, they were making up her eyebrows and everything, so doing that. So she gives her apologies. And I said, love, just enjoy being pampered. Just enjoy that. Also, as I came in, I, I met up again with Doug. Where are you, Doug? You're on the, at the back there somewhere. Now, Doug and I, believe it or not, were flatmates together in the early 80s. <laughs> and uh, I'm, a I'm a little bit nervous to share any stories about him because I know he knows stories about me as well. That Let's rather just keep it under wraps, hey, Doug. Let's keep it there. But it's so cool to see you and wonderful just to connect again with people that have been faithful in serving him and having faith in their hearts towards him for what God wants to do. It's important as we get older, not just to be faithful, but to be faith-filled. Because it's faith that God responds to. Not just faithfulness, but faith being filled with faith that yes, God, you can. And one of the big things that he can do and wants to do and desires to do is use each and every one of us in the great end time harvest. As I said a week or two ago, we're not all Billy Grahams or Reynold Bonkers or Fred Roberts or Oral Roberts, but each and every one of us can be effective in loving people, effective in extending Christ's heart and hands to people. And this evening, I'm going to be chatting about how do we engage with those salty conversations with people. We have spoken about how do we have salt in ourselves, a mini recap just by way of remembrance of soaking ourselves and our inner man with the knowledge of who Jesus is. Do you remember the salt pans in Volfus Bay? Allowing our hearts to be having his salt deposited because our salt comes from him. Thursday, we looked at salty, scripted prayers that we can pray over ourselves and one another. Those are those missional verses, those scriptures that we personalize, mix in faith, and pray in faith. And then we looked at the salty gospel. We don't want to promote a sweet gospel or a sour gospel, but a salty gospel that honors Christ, that acknowledges and promotes his lordship, his rulership, and his ownership over all things. We believe that Jesus must be so first in our lives, second doesn't even show in the photo. We need to have Christ first and foremost, Lord of all. And then we looked at our salt roots, which is R-O-U-T-E-S, not R-O-O-T-S. Just to clarify that for folk that looked at me a little strange. <clears throat> it's the salt roots of our everyday life and living because being a witness is to be a daily lifestyle. It's not a program. It's not now we're going to be a witness. No, I am a witness for Christ. And this evening, we're going to be looking at how do we have those salty conversations. And uh, I was just chatting a little with Liz earlier on, and I, uh, I didn't get enough detail, but just the little that I heard, how she had the opportunity this week to either be salt or to be pepper. The temptation was to be pepper, but she chose to be salt. You know when people rub you up the wrong way and they irritate the daylights out of you and you've got an, an, an option to either react or to respond. Salt sellers respond to life. God wants us to be responders, not reactors in life. Because we salt by our words, by our attitudes, and by our actions. That's the way we sprinkle salt. But this evening, I'm going to be focusing on the power of our words and how we can salt through the words we speak. <clears throat> I want to take the word salt as an acronym this evening, S-A-L-T. And we're going to break it down this evening, and we're going to look at how we can have salty conversation. The, the S 
And the letter salt is how do we start a conversation? The A is asking questions that build relational bridges. Asking questions, and we're going to just look at each one in a moment. Then the L in salt is listen carefully to the cry of the person's heart and to what the Lord is saying. And then the T in salt is tell them your story. Tell them your story. We're going to look at that in another evening in detail because a lot of people say, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in the Bible, but your own changed life, your own story, stroke, testimony is a profoundly powerful thing. But we'll look at that in a bit more detail. But in the book of Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 to 6, I'm just giving you the portion of Scripture. But Paul says, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. I want to read it again, but so often we haven't got this one highlighted because it's not a promise. But this is a, a truth and a principle of how we can begin to live salty lives. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you know how to answer everyone. My first thought in, on this is that there are three aspects of language. And I think, Lord, how can we have a language that best reflects you? Firstly, there's our body language. And how many of you know your body language says so much that either is engaging or just mind your own business? And when we start interacting with people, how many of you know hands in the pockets, hands folded, or just... Just give me space. But when you have a body language that's open, warm, and inviting, it wants to draw people in. If you can just think for a moment, God as a father, or Jesus when he lived in the Gospels, his life, what do you think his body language was towards the crowds and towards the people? It was continually just open arms, open heart. Come, come, listen, follow me. There's space and there's place for you. So the first thought I want to say before we actually get into the literal conversation is our body language reflecting Christ towards people. Does our body language always give busy signals to others or does our body language give, I will give you the time that you need? Because for me, time is not money, time is life. Very important. We live in a hectically busy, driven world, and we're called to be sheep in this world, not rats. You don't have to get caught up in the rat race of life when we're called to be sheep. We, we've got to be sheep, living with His peace, with His rest, that begins to speak volumes to people. The other aspect of language is your attitude. Do you know your Attitude has a language and has volume. I first found that out when I got married. It's not what I said, it's how I said it. And we need to realize that if we speak with warmth and acceptance and inviting, it, it, there's an attitude that people go, wow, you're different. And then, of course, there's the literal language that I believe our language needs to be that of respect, gentleness, Never rude, harsh, or pushy. These are little important things, but so often in our eagerness to share our faith, if people feel they've been coerced or forced into something, they'll back off. None of us like a pushy person that's wanting to sell a product. I almost draw my line in the sand. I said, no, you know, this deal finishes today. We're not selling a product as witnesses, we don't have a gospel product. The gospel is a person, Jesus. And the gospel is about inviting people into a relationship with him that will change their lives forever and ever. Another beautiful verse of scripture is found in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, where Peter writes, he says, In your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have, but do it with gentleness 
and respect. Again, very important key aspects with gentleness and respect. Now, the interesting thing, it says, uh, that initial verse that I read to you, where, where, where Paul said, let your conversation, and it implies it's a two-way thing. Because often many of us think sharing the gospel is me telling them what they need to believe and they need to believe now. We, I believe it's conversational. It's relational. It needs to be two-way. And if we're not hearing people out, why should they listen to us? I believe the days have moved on from street corner where you just preach and trust folks to repent right there and then. I believe people have wised up and they say, I want to see you living it. I want to see it revealed in you. And then I'm willing to listen and engage in a conversation with you. And often we need to realize that people are on a journey to faith that not every single person we talk to, we're going to share the whole gospel with them. But often the gospel of our lives and the way we conduct our lives with reference to our body language, our attitude language, and our, uh, the way we word things, people are going to take note. Now, it says, let your conversation be seasoned with grace. Can I say to you, I believe people's journey to faith starts by hearing grace-filled conversations. I believe as Christians, we need to be not positive, but faith-filled. I had a person out there say, well, are you so positive? I said, possibly that's how you might see me. I like to say, I'm able to see God in everything. I'm able to see what God can do in and out of every situation, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. I want to encourage you, have grace-filled words. Why? But the Bible says, you know it well in Ephesians 2, 8, it's by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's a gift from God. So when they begin to hear grace-filled words, and grace-filled means we stop being judgmental, critical, negative, complaining. How can you complain and moan and grumble about life and then share the gospel as well? We need to live grace-filled lives. That no matter what happens in life, God is bigger than, greater than, and He's got it all under control. Isn't it interesting, in Luke 4, 22, the people were amazed, this is a talking of Jesus, they were amazed at the gracious words that came from His lips. So Jesus was a person that was full of grace, and there were gracious words from his lips. In fact, in Luke 19, 48, it says, the people hung on every word. The religious people put heavies on people. You have to do this. You can't do this. You must do that. Always respect the free will of the people you're engaging and discussing and talking with. Never criticize or judge or knock what they believe. They'll defend it. Just present Jesus as better than and greater than. Whether it's a traditional church or whether it's a... a, 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 a I was walking in, you possibly heard about that imam in that mosque this last week that was attacked, one killed and uh, two others injured. And I said to people, wherever you go, I'm always saying... Jesus, you live in me. Who do you want to say hello to? Now, I don't go to a person that Jesus says hello. I'm not talking of that loopy stuff. I'm talking about just being friendly to people. It was on Thursday or Friday this last week. I was at La Lucia Mall, and I saw a Muslim cleric there. You know, they dressed in their robes and etc. etc. Went up to him, introduced myself. And I said, I'm a Christian. I heard about the tragedy that happened in one of your mosques. And I want to tell you as a Christian, we're praying for you. I said, that shouldn't have happened. Shouldn't have happened. What was I doing? I just did say, I never thought of that before. But as I saw him, I thought, Jesus, what would you want to do in this situation? Was every life matters to God. 
whether they're Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, New Age, Satanist, it doesn't matter. Every life matters to God. What that seed would outwork in his life, I don't know. But I felt Jesus wanted him to know there was a Christian that cared enough to pray and took the time just to greet him and meet him. See, there's always people that, that you need just to step out of your comfort zone into God's zone and just speak gracious words. See, gracious words are empowering words. They're words with hope and courage. Words that will awaken faith. I remember I was at the pick and pay and I saw a lady and she was expectant. And I always make sure I see the ejector button before I ask, are they pregnant? Because once I asked the lady, when were you going to have your baby? And she said, I'm not pregnant. So I have put both feet in it. But this particular lady, I could see she was pregnant. And I went up to her and I introduced myself. And I'm always looking for grace-filled words. And I didn't say Jesus tells, tells me to tell you this. I just said to her, you know what? Are you going to be a great mom? I said, it's your first baby, but you're going to be a terrific mom. Because God's designed you to not only carry a child, but to be able to make She just burst out in tears. And that started such a cool conversation about parenting. And then invited her to a mom's group. She came along. See, what it was, was a gracious words of empowering. Instead, I could have gone and said, you know what the Bible says about parenting? There's the book of Proverbs, and let me guide you in that. No, no, a gracious word for her at the moment, and I only found out afterwards how fearful and afraid she was to be a mom, but she didn't know whether she was going to be successful or a failure. But an empowering word, you're going to be a, a great mom that led to further conversation. Are you beginning to hear what I'm saying? God wants us to be grace-filled in our conversations with people. Avoid religious terminology where you're never good enough, you're never gonna amount to anything. We need to be aware of that and avoid that like the plague. Can I say in starting a conversation, we need to learn to slow down in life and to look around and to see who he's bringing into our world. I used to live too much in the fast lane of life, trying to do too much that made me at the end of the day not enjoy life and fulfill a lot, but not do it well. So I began to slow down and begin to just be able to say, Lord, what is it you want me to do today? Who is it would you like me to engage with? And on that journey to become observant, become an observer, become aware of. And sometimes a little thing you might share or say or do can change a person's life or their marriage. I remember I was at, um, I'd just come out of a movie, I was with Shirley, and we, we walked past the mug and bean, and there was a couple just sitting there chatting. And I just, they caught my eye. Can I say, we need to ask the Lord for eyes of a harvester. Eyes and the heart and the ears. And I just saw them and I, my immediate response is, Jesus, what would you have me say to them? And I just had these words come to heart and mind, is keep talking, it'll work out. Just keep talking. So I, I saw them there, I went up and said, Hello, sorry to interrupt your conversation. My name's Wally. Can I encourage the two of you to keep on talking it's all going to work out. And I walked off. Next minute, he's running after me. He says, who are you? So I said, I'm Wally. He says, we were busy talking about getting divorced. We're busy talking about quitting, and it's too hard, and it's not worth it. How did you know? I said, I didn't. Who told you? I said, I don't know. I didn't say, God told me. I said, would you like me to help you further? Can we help you in your marriage? Connected them up to couples that can help counsel them. Can I say in our propheticness, with words of wisdom, words of knowledge, we need to choose our words wisely and let them be gracious words of empowering. 
did you know the Bible says we need to be the first to greet people? To me, when my eyes catch anybody, I say hi. I say hello. You know what? There's a beautiful quote. A warm smile is the universal language of kindness and friendliness. And most of my conversations with people have just started off by being friendly and engaging. It's as simple as that. Can I encourage you to just start practicing that this week? I remember Ashley Bell, who was part of this church and one of the pastors, I'm talking of 30 plus years ago. I remember we had our offices, and I think it's called Hill Street. Something like that. I don't know if there's still that, that street here. We had offices there. And I don't know what Ash said once. You know what? I know more people than you in Pine Town. I said, no, Ash. He says, I promise you, let's go into the street, and I promise you, I know more people than you. So now, I was always up for a bit of fun. So we walked down into Hill Street. You can ask Ash. We laughed about it last year when we met up and we chatted about reminiscing. We're walking down, and we just go up to total strangers. How's it? How are you doing? And they look at you like, where on earth? And just go, that's one. Go to the next person. How's it? How are you? And we were walking up and down, just greeting, and like they were long lost family friends. And then we got in the office, and we just burst out laughing because we could see the folly and the stupidness of what we were doing. But there's a little truth in that. I believe as Christians, we ought to be the most friendliest people. I like to say, you know, the Bible says in Corinthians that we are the fragrance an aroma of Christ. You ever thought what that fragrance smells like? I believe it smells like friendliness. That fragrance smells like friendliness. Because friendliness opens people's hearts. I can, I, I've had all sorts of fun times when you just become friendly and, and I, we lived in Cape Town for 18 years and I remember this one person, I went and said, how's it, how are you? He just got so excited, I thought, oh Lord, this is so cool. Started engaging in conversation. And then he says, we're going to your house or to my house? I said, well, I'm going to my house, what do you mean? He thought I was picking him up, because he was gay. <laughs> and I said, I'm happily married. I think I was 34 years. I said, no, I'm happily married. But can I tell you the change that Jesus Christ has made in my life? And I just shared my story in a nutshell. I remember I was at Jack's Paints, also there, and, and there was a lady at the counter. And it was one of the very first times I've had a lady, I said, how's it? She looked at me, she says, you have got beautiful blue eyes. And she looked, and on the inside of me, I was trembling. I sort of stepped back. And I'm thinking to myself, help, Lord. And I just looked straight at her and I said, you know, my wife also tells me that. My wife also tells me that. And I said to her, you know, we're actually running an alpha course at this moment. Would you like to come along? There's a free meal. You're going to meet some great people. Why don't you come along? I tried. She declined. She declined. And there's sometimes there's nothing you can do. And sometimes fish you feed if you don't catch them. And don't be afraid. And I'm telling you stories of people that I haven't led to Christ, but I'm telling you that you can plant seeds and water seeds and feed. And if you think of your own life, how many people shared the gospel with you in attitude, in word, or in deed before you said yes to Christ? Please don't forget that because people are on a journey to Christ and then in Christ. And being a witness is helping people on that journey. As I said last week, and I want to emphasize it, please don't see people as targets. See them as treasures. I believe if we love people, God does a work in their lives. Please don't in any form or fashion feel the pressure or the weight that you have to lead somebody to Christ. We ought to be led to love people and to listen to people and to care for people and let God do the rest. In everything we do, we consider those that are far from God. My wife's favorite cake is a carrot cake. And Laurel, my younger daughter, she's 27, she made Shirley this beautiful cake. And we had a bit this afternoon. 
And one of the things Laurel said, you know what, when Shirley had her birthday in April, we invited a few unsafe friends, some of her friends, and there was a lady across number two, Shirley. She loved Laurel's carrot cake. And Laurel said, Dad, I've got a piece for her that I'm just going to be taking to her just to bless her. Can I tell you what? His love is in that carrot cake for her. Often our little deeds of kindness have a massive impact on other people. We surely now are planning to go this week to go watch that movie called, I Can Only Imagine. I've heard it's a very good movie. I love the music group Mercy Me. I don't know if you've heard any of their music. Brilliant, brilliant. It's his whole true life story. Devoted, committed Christian. Very seldom, Shirley and I like to go to movies alone. We always like to invite other people that most times don't know him. But often afterwards, we go for a coffee and we chat. What do you think about the movie? Was there a message in that movie for you or not? Would you recommend the movie? Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so everything we do, we're thinking of those that are far from him, of how can we take them on a journey? They can see we have fun together. We enjoy life. In fact, when we were in Cape Town, we used to have a monthly men's movie evening. We used to have up to 30 guys coming, and we'd choose a movie that's full of action, as little possible of swearing, and normally we'd have, one of the guys would have watched it before, and it's an opportunity where we invite all our unsafe friends, hey, us as going for a movie evening, you want to come and join us, popcorn, coffee, I could not believe the response from guys thinking, man, this is great to bond together and have fun together. Because most times they just do that in a pub. When you can let others see that you as a Christian have fun and enjoy life. Can I say avoid religious terminology? We're going to look at some of that in a moment. Because often people don't know what you're talking about. I've got a little clip that I'd like if we could please be so kind of play it, and then I'm going to chat a little bit about the language that we use when we're talking with those that are far from him. Thank you. Same. I wrote the same, but in different words. Thanks, love. beautiful feet, the Bible says, but I think often the way we choose our words are unhelpful. And I believe if we could just rethink our words, like for example, if I tell a person I'm a pastor, I almost can see the drawbridge go up and I can see the doors being slammed. So when I'm out in the world, I'm a life coach and I'm coaching people to life who is Christ. In him is life, and that life is the light of men. Whatever your terminology is, find something that people would be more open to. Now, for example, if you tell a person, you know you're a sinner and you're lost, 
I've heard people, I've heard others talk like that. I remember a particular church, I'm not going to mention the name, or the city. And we went to a mall, but they said, we've got to go to the mall, and we're doing tests and, and whatever else have you. And I said, I, I, was, I was cringing because they were saying, I remember the one person said to the guy, you know, you lost. He says, no, I know where I am, and I know where I'm going. That's what he said. He said, I know where I am, and I know where I'm going. I'm not lost. I said, you need to be saved. He said, saved from what? From who? From how? You see, we've often got Christianese that needs just to be rephrased for a greater impact and for people to reflect. I like to often, when I'm engaging with a person that's far from God, I said, how would you, would you consider the thought or the idea of having a personal two-way relationship with Jesus Christ. Because when man fell and disobeyed God, there was a disconnect between God and man. And if you look at the world today, the mess that the world is in is not God to blame, but man that has been living disconnected from God. And that's why Jesus came to reconnect us back to God that he could become our father. See, I've said the gospel just in a different way. Often people have used the words, hey, you need to repent of your sin. And repent is a Bible word. I'm not saying put away that. I like to say to people, how about doing a 180 degree turn on the way you're living currently? It's the same as repentance. What about doing a 180 degree turn on how you're living, and instead of living for yourself, you start to live for Jesus Christ. That's another way of dethroning self and enthroning Christ. You see, it's using terminology that they go, ah, I can understand that. Even as a nearly 60 year old, some of the SMS language I don't understand. And often think about it, a person that's far from God, never been in church before, doesn't know our lingo. We speak foreign to them. I remember the one time I, I said, could you turn to Matthew? And the couple in the front, they looked at each other and said, I don't know, Matthew. <laughs> and then I realized, hold on a second, They've never set foot on the inside of a church building facility. There was another time they walked in, another couple walked in, young couple. They possibly were parting the night before. I overheard them say, hey, this is a cool church. Looks like we're going to have shots later today. They were looking at our communion table. In their minds, the little glasses were shots. And so what I am asking you is rethink of the words we use. When we speak of Christianity, I like to use the word a personal two-way relationship with God as a Father, Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And then I open up Lord, it means for Him to be your master, first, foremost. Not as an attachment, but as central to everything. It's just really looking at our words to help people understand. I even shy away from the word, can I tell you my testimony? I'd rather use the word, can I tell you a cool, true story? Just said a little different. With the word testimony is often associated with a court. So and so is going to give a testimony of what they've heard and seen. Is that right or not? So what we're doing is just to share your true story. We all love true life stories. You know, you just got to confess Jesus is Lord. Yeah, there is that confess, but how about rephrasing it as you just got to admit and acknowledge Him first and foremost in your life. And there's a willingness in your heart to believe in everything He did for you at the cross and then follow Him as a disciple. It's just changing it a little bit can I tell you what I think a lot more pennies would drop 
I've had people say, well, are you religious? I said, no, no, no. That's one of the worst swear words you could call me. Because I'm not religious. I want to have a relationship with Jesus. We're promoting relationship. The gospel is relation. Is, he's my cue to land. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. Oh, okay. Then let me speed up. <laughs> the, is we need to ask questions that build relational bridges. As I said, the gospel is about loving, asking, and then sharing. It's interesting that God is the God that started the principle of asking questions. Often we think the gospel is telling, it's asking. In the gospels, Jesus himself asked over 70 questions. Questions help us understand where people are. Do you remember God asked Cain, I asked Adam, where are you? You know what I've loved to ask people? Where are you in relation to God? They, Whoa, no, God's distant God. No, I don't believe he exists. And I could go, how can you not believe he exists when you look at the stars, etc.? I'd say, rather, I'd say to them, what brought you to the place of not believing in God? I just keep asking questions and then they begin to realize that, hold on a second, let me consider what this guy's saying. Do you remember when Cain killed Abel? God didn't go to Cain. Hey, Cain, what on earth have you done? God went to Cain and said, where is your brother? Again, a question. The woman at the well, Jesus went, would you give me a drink? Do you see, he was engaging asking questions I'm not afraid to ask people what is your view on religion what do you think about God what do you think about the mess in the world in which we live see questions probe the heart and begin to draw things out think of Jesus he asked in Matthew 16 who do people say the son of man is he was asking the disciples you know the answers there and then, and then he says now what about you See, asking questions. The scripture that I've been quoting a lot in Matthew 5, you're the salt of the earth. And Jesus asked the question, how can it be made salty again? Question. Matthew 18, often Jesus used the little words, what do you think? I love to ask people those questions. What do you think about? Because then I begin to have an understanding of where they are. Because often we tell them things they don't need to hear. Why are questions important? They show genuine interest in a person. Now the questions I'm talking about is not interrogating a person, but in love, with sincerity and genuineness, asking. Questions show that you care about a person. Questions help you to maximize and utilize time wisely. Questions stir us to begin to think through and develop our own convictions. I remember we were looking at Table Mountain before we left Cape Town. I said to the person next to me, man, isn't this amazing? And they said, Mother Nature is amazing. So I said, is she really? Where did you get that understanding from? And then she started thinking and talking and we entered into such a cool conversation that started at Mother Nature and ended with Father God as creator. Do you see, so what I am saying to you is begin to reflect on the questions we ask. How can I begin to start asking better questions and it helps develop relational bridges? I like to ask people what they think, what, there's a, what their opinion, what brought them to this place. How did you discover this? How real is it? Avoid asking questions that are closed. Uh, and I've, I've just got a number. Now, what we used to do in our area, and I've started doing it now, is our registration is NUR, just to be a CA. If we see anybody with a different registration, we knew they were new in town. And we'd make time to connect with them, to engage with them. I like to ask them, 
Have you made any friends? How have you found living in Cape Town? Some people are tough, it's difficult, haven't made friends, very clicky. My next response, can we invite you over for tea? See, when they express a need or a, a pain or a loss or whatever, say, hey, we'd love to invite you over. Have you made some good friends? Etc. Etc. Now, I'd like just to just divert a little further. I'm also always looking out for tattoos, plaster cast scars, because every scar has a story to tell. Every plaster cast or moon boot or crutch has a story to tell. And so many times I'd say, "Whoa, that's a," you know, I could see that scar on your shoulder or your neck. Wow, what happened? And I haven't heard one person said nothing. Most times I say, I nearly lost my life or this tragedy happened. And then my next response is, you know, he saved you for a purpose because he's got a big plan for your life. Do you know what that plan is? Well, most of them acknowledge somewhere, somehow God has been good by sparing them and saving them but they don't know what his purpose and plan is. And that's why I say, would you like me to help you? Would you like me to help you see that God saved you for a purpose and a plan? It's far bigger than what you can imagine. Most tattoos, there's a story to it. I went and recently got my ink cartridge refilled. And the lady at the till, I must confess, had the ugliest tattoo I've ever seen on her shoulder, not a little one, a big, ugly tattoo. Now, I thought it. I repented of it. And I said to her, it's an interesting tattoo. What made you get that tattoo on your shoulder? It wasn't a little one. It was a big one. She said, no, it's the Mexican angel of death. You know, the guy with the sickle and the hood and, you know, if one day if I were, she gets married, Her hubby's got to look at that. But I said, what made you decide to get that tattoo? She said, my dad had one. And when he passed, I wanted to never forget him. So I got that. I said, I can sense you're still grieving the loss of your dad. And then she started weeping. Over the tool register, I said, would you like to talk to my wife who could help you with the grieving that you could find joy in your loss and find God as a father? She said, yes. How did that start with a tattoo? I love to ask, well, what made you put the tattoo there and how? what happened? Tell me the story behind it. And I've had so many opportunities just to engage in a conversation over those things. I like to ask people, What is their life purpose? What's their life purpose? What are their dreams? I remember one guy said, I want to be a millionaire. I said, that's amazing. That's great. And then he hadn't thought beyond the million. Hadn't thought beyond the million. And I said to him, you know, money is a great thing, but it's not a good thing if money has you. And I said, you know, money is a a helpful tool. It can buy you a bed, but it can't buy you sleep. Money can buy you books, but not brains. I said, money can't buy you the most important things in life. It can buy you medicine, but not health. You can get friends, but not real love. Then I said, you know what? The greatest gifts of all are free. I said, would you mind if I told you my story of how I came to faith? And then from there, shared my story. I'm just giving you some examples of how you can begin just to engage with people in friendly conversation. Never get into arguments. Please don't ever. If people ask you questions that are irrelevant, I call them tangent questions. How did Noah get all the animals in the ark? You know, please don't go into a big theological thing. You know what? I'm going to ask him one day, but I don't know here. 
But if they do ask you questions, I remember this one guy, he just was the Big Bang Theory. He was adamant this all started through the Big Bang. He says, an interesting mindset and thought that you have. I said, have you watched explosions? Have you watched bombs blast? I said, you know what? Every bomb that I've ever seen go off on YouTube, etc., they blast everything into further away from one another, not together. And if you look at this planet, how beautifully it's been designed with all the various ecosystems, that explosion, you could have such great faith to believe an explosion brought that together. Only God, through His spoken word, could bring it together in such detail that everything works in sync. I like to ask people, do you think there's a difference between Christianity and religion? And you know, sometimes when people ask you a question like, why are there so many different denominations? Good question. Why are there so much division? Good question. That's not God's heart that there be division. And I said, you know, if you had a choice tonight to go out for dinner, it's on me. What restaurant would you go to? Oh, I'd go to Chinese or I'd go to Mexican. I'd go to steakhouse. I said, that's why possibly there's so many different churches. There's a different flavoring, different taste. Some loud, some quiet. Some have a liturgy. Others have overheads. Some have PowerPoint. It's just different. But they all love God, love one another, and want to make a difference. Can I encourage you that often in your journey with people, it could be two or three times that you meet and encounter them have a coffee, have a meal, have a whatever. Sometimes your conversation will just be over natural things. Just natural things. Please don't sweat that. Please don't sweat that. Often we think when I first meet, we've got to tell them the gospel. No, you've got to love them. You've got to listen to them. Journey with people. Listen to people. Listen to them. Listening seems easy. Can I tell you what? It's one of the hardest things. Proverbs 18, 13 says, He who answers before listening, that is his folly and shame. I'd like to quote to you Larry King. He says, this great TV presenter, he says this, I've never learned a thing while I'm talking. I realize every morning that nothing I say today will teach me anything. So if I'm going to learn a lot today, I have to do a lot of listening. Listen to people in the cry of their heart. Listening is not having a passive mind that's in neutral with your mouth shut, waiting your turn to talk. It's acknowledging what they're saying. It's, it's responding appropriately, not brushing off. Reflect what kind of listener am I? Can I say, I like to reflect on my day of the different people I've met. And I say, Lord, I'm a disciple. I'm a learner. Lord, how better could have I done it today? I don't beat myself up because I'm a learner. So every day I say, Lord, how can I salt other people's lives through my words, my attitudes, my actions? How can I ask better questions, Lord? Lord, help me to listen attentively to you and to what others are saying. Lord, help me, please, Lord. And then just to tell your story of grace in my life. Your changed life is the best advert this world needs to see of Jesus. People don't believe the Bible, but your changed life is witness of God's goodness, greatness, and grace. Can I ask you this week, those that came on Thursday night, you've got homework, which I remind you of. Can I ask you this coming week to get out of your comfort zone and just be friendly to people? Acknowledge people. Ask them how they're doing. And please don't take a, a rebuff personally. I've asked the person, how are you? You don't look so well. He looks at me and says, you're not my doctor. I remember at the gym the one time, uh, I was up there, believe it or not, I tried to push a few weights, but I really went up just to see who was up there. And there was a guy pacing up and down. He was walking 
going, <sighs> and I thought, oh, Lord, this oak is stressed. I need a few sessions with him. This guy's red. So I actually stopped him. I said, you know, because he was like veins bulging from his neck. I said, are you okay? You look really stressed. I'll take you for a coffee down in Kauai and we can chat. He looked at me, says, no, I'm fine. I'm just psyching myself up to pick up those weights. (laughs) I could tell you so many other funny stories where I misread things. But you've got to try. You've got to try. You've got to just engage with people. Don't take rejection personally. He took the ultimate rejection of the cross. I live in the knowledge I'm accepted and loved by him. So no matter what anybody says or does to me, I let it be like water off a duck's back. But can I encourage you just to greet or meet new people and just love them? Say, Lord, how can I be a blessing and show your kindness and start a conversation and trust that it goes somewhere, if not the first time, the second, the third, or wherever? Can I encourage you to do that? Please, those that came on Thursday, bring the names of those people that are your neighbors, your work colleagues, friends that are far from God. We're going to be praying for them this coming Thursday. And we're going to trust for God to give you His strategy, how to nudge them closer to Him. How they can begin to start a journey towards Jesus. I'd like to close in prayer. Could I ask you to stand, please? Father, I ask you this evening and all that I've shared and spoken and chatted that, Holy Spirit, you'd make sense of it all in every person's heart and mind. And Father, I pray for fresh courage and fresh conviction that each and every one of us are called to be witnesses for you. And that, Lord, we would go out into the world and love the world with your kind of love, your agape love. That, Lord, we'd acknowledge people, become aware of and notice. We wouldn't walk past people, but acknowledge them. Father, I pray for that this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.